The question is, does good investment already mean green and correct investment? Now, that's a question that our next speaker has been asking, not just himself, but a hell of a lot of other people. And uh, we're happy to have on the line, live uh, from, I presume, Paris, Harvard Holland. Uh, he is from the OECD Development Center. And uh, at the beginning of this year, Harvard, uh, you have actually published together with uh, a number of colleagues a paper called Mobilizing Institutional Investment capital for climate aligned development now it's a mouthful can you explain to us what that exactly means and how we could follow you yes thank you um, yeah I've been active uh, with regard to uh, mobilizing the capital of sovereign, uh, sovereign wealth funds towards um, towards climate objectives, as you say. The paper that you mentioned is about the structure of development finance institutions uh, and their ability to, to, mobilize, um, to mobilize capital from private investors. So uh, if I may, I will share my presentation on that. Um, and uh, I'm happy to take questions also on sovereign wealth funds uh, afterwards. Um, so I'll share my screen here. Give me a second. Thank you. Well, we are really in our Zoom world. We all expect uh, there to be a little moment of switchover. And uh, can you see my screen now? Um, well, we don't, but ah, there it is. Fantastic. Now there's the Excellent. mouthful. So, great. Well, thank you, and thank you for having me. Um, so I will try to say something about why uh, development finance institutions and uh, multilateral development banks are not mobilizing as much private capital as they should. Uh, I spent uh, six years at the World Bank uh, and I've worked with a number of the other development finance institutions um, as partners of the World Bank. And uh, so this is based on, on that experience and also uh, the insights and experience of my, my co-authors at, uh, at Stanford uh, and other places. So let me just first say something about uh, how the financing gap for the SDGs has widened. Then I will say, uh, I will contrast the capacity of the multilateral development banks, MDBs, and development finance institutions, DFIs, to mobilize private capital with institutions that have been more successful, green banks and strategic investment funds. And finally, I will say something about why uh, my co-authors and I think uh, that this is the case and how we think that MDBs and DFIs need to be reformed to be able to mobilize uh, uh, private finance more uh, effectively. So first, um, let me see if I can change this slide. Um, there he is. Um, first, the, the, uh, a, a few numbers. Uh, according to the OECD Global Outlook on Financing for Sustainable Development, published earlier this year, uh, global financial assets are at their highest since before the financial crisis at, uh, at $379 trillion. And now, 81% of that is held in advanced economies, 15% in China, and only 4% uh, in countries that are eligible for official development assistance. Then there is the number that I would uh, like uh, to talk about today, uh, which is 0.08%. So that is the number that you get if you divide total annual official development assistance by the value of assets held by institutional investors. So it's clear that uh, ODI does indeed need to mobilize private capital. Now, uh, as we know, multilateral finance institutions and development finance institutions have made great efforts to mobilize private capital. In 2019, MDBs and DFIs mobilized 63.6 billion of private finance. Although this might may be an overestimation since much of it comes from, from impact investors and it's um, already available for development. Now, we are very far away <coughs> from covering uh, the SDG financing gap. Uh, as follows from the slides here, um, the, uh, uh, the, the gap has grown from $2.5 to $4.2 trillion during the COVID crisis. 
But this consists of an estimated one trillion additional need for forward spending and 700 billion drop in external private resources in 2020. This is a drop that's 60% larger than the drop after the, COVID, after the global financial crisis. Now, according to the OECD Global Outlook, we are allocating just 1.1% of total assets held by institutional investors and asset managers, or $4.2 trillion, would be sufficient to fill the gap in SDG financing. However, very little capital from institutional investors, uh, such as pension funds, insurance companies, and sovereign wealth funds, um, goes, goes into development finance. And we argue that to attract the interest of institutional investors, multilateral finance institutions must begin to, to look at these large institutional investors as their partners and as their clients. And also, multilateral finance institutions must go from a focus on financial, financial instruments to a stronger focus on institutional and governance aspects within the multilaterals themselves. Now, if we look at green banks, there, well, there, over the last decade, it, we have seen that there have been a number of, uh, of green banks established and also uh, strategic investment funds. The reason that we are interested in these uh, types of institutions is that they have been uh, quite efficient at mobilizing private capital. So if we look at green banks, the multiplier effects range uh, from 1.8 uh, to 10. So that's 1.8 to $10 of private investment for every dollar of public capital deployed. Similarly, if we look at uh, strategic investment funds, there is a wide range of multipliers. Ireland's fund has a multiplier of around two. Uh, the EU's Marguerite fund and Senegal's Ponsis has multipliers of around 10. Now, we uh, had not estimated multipliers for multi multilateral finance institutions. Instead, we, we used uh, multilateral climate funds as a proxy for multilateral finance institutions, since the, the governance arrangements and institutional arrangements are, are similar. And here the picture is quite different from green banks and strategic investment funds. Multilateral uh, climate funds can have multipliers as high as six or seven, but most of this capital comes from other public investors. So if we use the ratio for, uh, of, of private to public capital, you have multipliers that are around 0 0.3 or 0 0.4, which, which is consistent with, uh, with other estimates for, uh, for multilateral development banks overall. So for every dollar of public capital deployed, there's only 30 or 40 cents of private capital co-invested. So the, question, the big question is, of course, why is this? So let's compare some salient features of green banks and strategic investment funds with those of multilateral climate funds. Now, the most important thing is uh, on governance. Sovereign funds and green, uh, successful green banks and, and strategic investment funds have governance structures similar to private sector institutions, and in many ways, they, uh, they work similarly to private sector financial institutions. Now, if you go to uh, multilateral climate funds, reflecting uh, mul the multilateral uh, institutions overall, board composition emphasizes country representation. So board members may not have financial sector background. You, do, you wouldn't have independent directors on the board app appointed for their, for their sector expertise. You wouldn't have uh, investment committees with majority representation of independent directors. Um, and, and you know that kind of elements, which uh, which uh, uh, are important uh, in uh, in the world of uh, of, uh, of uh, private investment. Um, another element is that institutional investors are increasingly joining forces on collaborative platforms. And one reason uh, uh, that collaborative platforms are established is that some institutional investors seek to reduce their dependence on financial intermediaries. Uh, asset managers, essentially, and other financial intermediaries, and bring investment, <coughs> investment man management in-house. Now, we think that collaborative platforms offer an opportunity for multilateral finance institutions to engage directly with institutional investors. If there are no intermediaries, they can go straight to the owners of the capital. However, as of now, collaborative platforms of institutional investors have nearly no presence of development finance pro pro providers. So, uh, so what are the, the, the potential implications of this for multilateral finance institutions? 
Well, apparently it should be that uh, that the multilaterals should mobilize capital on, on collaborative platforms, and then they should work, work with uh, local strategic investors, such as green banks and strategic investment funds, to deploy the capital. But not quite the case, uh, because when we talk to, uh, to um, institutional investors, we found that they are not necessarily eager to work with multilateral finance institutions. There is a concern that projects uh, that are pitched to them by multilateral finance institutions will be sub-commercial or high risk, or that if something goes wrong with the project, a development bank may not react as a commercial investor. So overall, institutional investors tend to be wary of double bottom lines. So what we argue in our paper is not only that multilateral finance institutions need to engage on collaborative platforms and with local strategic investments, investors, but that to do so, they may also need to change. Uh, they need to continue to function within policy policy defined mandates but within that mandate they may need to become become more like uh like uh, private investment institutions so multilateral finance institutions uh, may need to become more like uh, the most efficient efficient green banks and strategic investment funds they may need to bring their governance more into line with private sector organizations uh, multilateral finance institutions tend to be quite risk averse. They may need to find uh, ways to address risk aversion and strengthen their capacity to, to, to assess and manage risk on commercial, on commercial terms. They may need to, to source projects more broadly, not only from, from governments. Uh, and to function effectively on, on collaborative platforms, they may need to recruit, recruit more staff with a financial sector background. So. Uh, let me provide some, some elements of, of a collaborative uh, model uh, for, for institutional, uh, excuse me, for multilateral finance institutions. We think that to engage with institutional investors, multilateral finance institutions need to engage on terms that are interesting to these investors. The proper, the, excuse me, the proper question for multilateral finance institutions to ask executives of institutional investor organizations is what keeps you up at night? How can I help you mitigate the risk that you are facing? And if we work together to mitigate risk, which new geographies and sectors do you think that we could move into? So multilateral finance institutions need to, I, need to be able to add value for institutional investors. They need to be able to provide institutional investors with the confidence that blended finance investments are crucial and they need to, uh, and that they can assist the institutional investors with assessing risks in new in new geographies and in new sectors. And finally, we think that a blanket approach to blended finance it, it could be counterproductive because some some geographies and regions will always be the remit of, of public finance. So multilateral finance institutions could focus uh, or should focus uh, on mobilizing capital from institutional investors in contexts where, where uh, commercial private investment is likely to be feasible and where the scale is sufficient for institutional investors. Uh, and clearly, as we saw from the numbers at the beginning, without the mobilization of capital from institutional investors, it, it will be very hard to achieve the sustainable development uh, goals and, uh, and to address climate change uh, generally. And much of this capital has to go to emerging markets and developing countries uh, which will ha which will have the fastest growing emissions uh, unless something uh, unless something is done about it and this is addressed efficiently. Um, and the current strategies for private capital mobilization are not achieve achieving the necessary scale. So uh, we think that that it's time to think anew on this. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, we all were sort of sitting here very still and trying to follow your every word. Um, uh, this morning, uh, just to take you uh, into the conversation that we already had, uh, we had a lady uh, working for a uh, London uh, fund uh, saying that she is, for example, investing and trying to get more investors into uh, financing land use change. Um, Again, she said it's very difficult to get private investors into it. Um, and of course, uh, it's the fund and the dedication of the fund that puts the money there. So what would be your advice to uh, a challenge like that? And we have many more challenges out there, whether it be UNICEF engaged in similar uh, things. So um, 
uh, how do you get the right people? We can't wait till maybe the 18-year-olds of today that have the right thinking are in the positions to decide where the money goes. I think there should be uh, well. Firstly, it's it's clear that some for some for some investments, it, it has to be there has to be a significant amount of, of, of public capital uh, to to provide risk mitigation uh, and other kinds of of, of uh, credit enhancement. Um, but uh, in general terms, for mobilizing uh, for mobilizing capital, uh, I think that uh, you, you have to bring in you have to bring in the the owners of the capital. Uh, and you, so you have to bring in the uh, if you if you are on the public side, if you are from a development bank, um, you might actually have to bring in uh, asset owners uh, on uh, on uh, in your ownership structure and uh, and on your boards um, and uh, have a structure where they uh, have a say not only in in co investing but also uh, but also in. Uh, in where the uh, where the where the shared capital goes, how it's deployed, um, and and where you have a much more fluid uh, a fluid inter interaction between uh, between the private sector and uh, and the public sector financial institutions. Harvard, thank you very much. And you see, ladies and gentlemen, I'm breaking the rules. I mean, in principle, this should have been a keynote and no Q and A afterwards. But thank you very much that you were there for that uh, and for us. Uh,